Hi, this is Ted from the Rosendale Community Theater. I'd like to welcome you to um, our discussion uh, following our screening of um, Italian cinema classics. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Professor Howard Menikoff, and um, we're going to uh, share some experiences and uh, feelings about um, Italian films or our, our own personal experience with Italian films. And uh, yeah, so we hope you'll find this interesting. Uh, personally, I mean, I, I, I um, Howard and I are about the same age, so uh, I, I have to say that my first experience with Italian film was um, uh, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up, which was um, not exactly an Italian film, but he was obviously an Italian director, but it was um, um, a, a film about London in the 60s, and I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I know I, I was about 15, I think, when it came out. And uh, my friends and I saw this and we were all blown away. And, and um, it was just the coolest movie we had ever seen. And so, uh, and all of us wanted to be fashion photographers uh, after seeing that film. Uh, the only thing I can say is that after we, uh, as I became a little older and wiser, I realized the director was sort of an asshole and uh, he was not quite as um, uh, sympathetic a character as we had looked at, but we were impressed by the um, superficialities of his very cool lifestyle. So. Um, and after that, I, I, uh, some, I was, I guess, like 18 or so, I saw my first Fellini, um, which was uh, Satyricon. Uh, I had been studying, uh, studying classical, uh, uh, I, I've been studying a lot of Greek and Roman history in school, and Satyricon was uh, Greek and Roman history in a, a way I'd never seen it before. I mean, Virgil and Horace were never the same after that. Um, but on the other hand, I thought it was also extremely cool and um, and also more than a little bit psychedelic, which I discovered later on was not an entire coincidence. Uh, and um, and then when I was around uh, 18 and 19, I started making my working on my own films and I, I began to appreciate Fellini as a director and as a filmmaker. And um, I realized that this guy was uh, a genius. And so um, but I didn't really get a chance to um, I didn't really get a chance to uh, explore his film in depth uh, or Fellini films in depth until I uh, studied directing at the State Film School in Sweden. And then we looked at uh, eight and a half. We looked at um, um, we looked at um, uh, we looked at La Strada and uh, and basically analyzed the films and analyzed what he had done and. Uh, the bottom line is that the more I study Fellini, uh, the more I appreciate how great he was. Um, and then the, the, the coup de grace was um, putting together a course on Fellini for um, the great director series of um, the place I teach now, SUNY FIT, Rash Institute of Technology in New York. And then I got a chance to see every one of Fellini's films and, and analyze them. And that, that was a real treat. I mean, uh, because the, the one thing I have to say about Fellini is that he always, um, basically he, he never repeated himself. He tended to take, it, take uh, chances all the time. And, uh, and, he's, uh, and that's why one of the reasons why he's so widely respected by his fellow directors. Um, Howard, do you have anything to say about your introduction to Italian film? Well, uh, my introduction to Italian film is kind of, uh, growing up, I was, a movie fan and went to see many, many movies. And in the late 60s, I discovered the Bleecker Street Cinema and Film Forum and suddenly discovered the world of, of foreign films that I'd been missing. So suddenly there was all these Italian films and French films and Japanese films and, and Swedish films. And I was just blown away by the, the whole different take of cinema compared to Hollywood. Although I do have a deeper appreciation of Hollywood films as a result of that too. Um, and then, uh, so I, and after the fact, I'd seen, um, let's see, The Bicycle Thief and Umberto D and Rocky, Rocco and his brothers were, you know, uh, those were surprising to me when I saw those films. And it led to, uh, it, it just furthered my interest in films in general. And then when I taught a course on Italian cinema, I actually uh, did uh, Rossellini's uh, Rome Open City for the first time when I saw that. And in my in-depth study of Italian film, I just was amazed at how many really quality films there were in Italian films. There was the neorealism in the, in the late 40s after World War I, but then there was another boom of Italian film in the 60s. Um, so uh, of just wonderful films coming out. So it's an interesting uh, cinema to study, uh, Italian film.
Yeah, I think one of the things that I uh, just appreciated after, I mean, the more I, I actually had a, the opportunity to go to Italy a couple of times and uh, in the uh, 70s. And um, but my very first uh, job in, in Italy was taking a film to the Venice Film Festival. I, I was taking an American film, which I had to hand deliver to the director of the Venice Film Festival, Luigi Chiarini, who was a, a big deal in, actually in neorealism at the time. And um, so um, I, I got to see, uh, basically in, in, in Italy, they take the film business very seriously. It, it's, um, I think in some ways it seems to be a national treasure. Um, and I would say it's even more important in Italy than it is in France. And France, I know it's very big, but somehow in Italy, the, the film industry is, um, well, first of all, it's a big business. I mean, they, um, uh, after the Second World War, as you were saying, um, you know, as, 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 you, as you know, I mean, I certainly wasn't around then, but when, when um, Mussolini was a dictator, he decided to make um, uh, Italy a, a powerhouse of film production. And he built the Cinecittà Studios, which uh, we show in our film Ante Vista. And um, they were probably, the, I mean, among the most spectacular studios in Europe at the time. They were very heavily damaged during the Second World War, but then they were uh, refurbished and uh, um, uh, resurrected for Federico Fellini. They became Fellini's home. And um, so most of Fellini's major films were in fact shot at Cinecittà. And um, I, I uh, but I mean, what I, what I learned when I was in Italy was that um, they were making three or 400 films a year. They're making an incredible number of films. Most of the films were not really what we would consider to be um, art films or quality films. They, were, they had their commercial fare, which tended to be the, um, they had their, um, the, basically they were doing B films competing with Hollywood for the global market. Because uh, the Italians apparently, uh, thank, again, thanks to Mussolini, they became experts at dubbing. So the, all the Italian films were basically shot uh, as to what the great German director said, mit out sound, MOS. <laughs> and, and, and then the, um, they were dubbed into a variety of different languages and that made it possible to distribute to around the world. So the, the Italians were uh, in, the, I guess in the 60s and 70s were competing with Hollywood uh, to do um, uh, a variety of different genre films. Uh, Cause again, this is before television took over. And this is when, when so, so film was still like the dominant medium for distribution. And uh, so the Italians were producing all these films and most of them were not what we would consider to be, you know, great in films. But on the other hand, they were commercial productions which gave people jobs, which gave people technical training. And some of the films like the Spaghetti Westerns, like the famous Spaghetti Westerns by Sergio Leone, we consider now to be very good. Uh, so, um, but what, what I thought was interesting in, in, in Italy, which I, I learned from my Italian friends was that um, the big, big producers uh, would uh, like the Rizzolis and um, the Pontis would, would um, they would do their commercial stuff, but then they would want to do like one or two quality films with a quality director just for, shall we say, prestige or national prestige. And um, so, so they would support again uh, Fellini or, or or one of the others uh, that we were talking about, uh, just for the sake of like like their own personal prestige, and this um, this made the uh, Italians um, for me it's quite they're quite unique unique in Europe. I, I don't think any other country had this amount of production in Europe, and um, and then also because of this 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 um, amount of production. Uh, actually, some of the films they made were, you know, they, they had they had a number of different. Oh, they, and they supported their directors. For heaven's heaven sake, I should I should forgot to say that. I mean, a lot of these directors were doing very, you know, creative stuff, uh, like uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini and um, uh, and others. And this was not, you know, commercial fare at all. And they would still get a chance to make their movie. Hilo Pontecorvo was another one, the one that I would mention before, the guy who did Battle of Algiers. And, uh, and these are today, I mean, like Battle of Algiers, I think today is still um, sort of the classic film about you know, de decolonialism or colonial strife. And then there's the other film by uh, Ponte Corbo, um, which I think should be shown uh, every year on uh, Martin Luther King Day, Burn with Marlon Brando, which is about a slave revolt in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, so, um, 
I, I, I have enormous respect for Italian cinema. And, and, and what, I, what I appreciate also is that even though the directors were very diverse, I mean, as diverse as, shall we say, Antonioni and Fellini, they all supported each other. And I think that, that that's cool. They, they supported each other as artists and they supported each other um, professionally and commercially. And because they thought, I, I think they thought that was, you know, what was good for, one was good for Italian film. And that, that so I, I, I have enormous respect for them. One of the things you asked me was, um, who is your favorite Italian director now? You're asking me? Yeah. Well, you... <laughs> that's, not, that's not fair. Uh, no, I mean, um, I, um, I was working on this Fellini course, and then the, the, somebody, this was like 10 years ago, and, and somebody came up, they, they, they had this movie by an Italian director, which was a remake of, um, um, I think it was the remake of La Dolce Vita. So it was, it was, I think that was it. Uh, and it was by a uh, Italian director I'd never heard of. And uh, we looked at it together. And um, I, I remember seeing this when I was in Asia. And, and um, I forget the title of that movie. It, it got an Academy Award. I thought it was really bad. I thought it was a really bad copy of Fellini. I mean, like really second rate Fellini. And um, so uh, to make a long story short, I mean, I, I don't know of any Italian directors now, contemporary, whom I like at all. I, I think, you know, uh, Fellini, Fellini made a really uh, cool movie called Ginger and Fred, which is about how the television industry sort of took over the film industry in, in, in Italy. And I think, um, I think you could basically say that about European film in general. I don't think there are many European films being made nowadays, which are uh, anywhere near as interesting as, as the films that were made like in the what 60s, 70s, and, and even 80s. The, the uh, last Italian film I loved was uh, The Great Beauty by Puello Sarantino, 2013. Yeah, no, that's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> that one you didn't like. I like no. it. No, I, I hated it. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's about the guy who's, uh, he just likes to watch and he's watching all these uh, orgies and things like that. But I mean, well, um, I haven't seen many Italian movies, major Italian films released in the last couple of years. I, I can't think of any, I, you know, but I, I mean, um, but I mean, I, 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 you know, in fairness to the Italians, I mean, I, I would go across, uh, you know, Europe and I would be hard pressed to find any European films that I particularly uh, like in recent years. I mean, I mean, there's a couple of good films coming out of Germany, um, but you know, the good stuff is basically on television, like as we know. And, and uh, I think um, the great directors end up working on, you know, for television because television has the, uh, has the, they have the money. So it's, it's like, um, um, you know, they had this famous, uh, Helen Mirren was asked, the great actress, Helen Mirren, um, you know, why do you work on Netflix? And she said, well, uh, I mean, that's, that's, we don't have many choices. So, uh, so, um, um, so I know as she said, so she said, on the one hand, uh, I love Netflix. On the other hand, she said, fuck, ne fuck Netflix. So, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, the business is changing and we have to sort of uh, allow for a change in the business model. Uh, but I think it's, uh, you know, what, what, what we consider to be the golden age of cinema, where, I mean, you, you and I were lucky enough to be in New York at the time in, in, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s when, um, you know, you had all these uh, art house or revival theaters and you could go see everything by um, what Akira Kurosawa or um, um, uh, or Fellini or or, or, or you know, the Bergman. Big sorry Bergman you know yeah Bergman I mean they're the big name directors and and, and, and um, you know and that was a, that was a real luxury uh, I, I remember seeing um, that they had a place up in the Upper West Side I mean there were all these theaters I, I, I can't remember the names but they had I, I remember seeing um, Ozu Tokyo Story in one of those theaters up there. The New Yorker, maybe. Maybe, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it was, I mean, there was so many uh, to choose from, and um, and then uh, you know, as I was staying in New York, the theaters just vanished bit by bit by bit, and there were fewer and fewer. And so now uh, we're in a situation where, um, you know, if you want to see uh, a revival, you, maybe you can find something at Angelica Film Center. Um, but I mean, the, the film the, forum still runs. Oh, the film forum. Sorry, yes, yeah. of course. Um, 
but so so what what what's sad is uh, you know uh, how are people introduced to these films and and so that's why it's a, I mean, it's a luxury for uh, for me I know and I'm sure you feel the same way to be able to teach uh, a course on Fellini because uh, I'm teaching at uh, Fashion Institute of Technology which is basically a design school and of course Fellini films have a lot of uh, art direction and design and and basically. Um, one of the things that I, I really, really like about Fellini is that um, he always had, he basically he has a very good heart. He has a very kind spirit. So even in his films, when he's showing uh, really bad people, uh, like, like in La Strada, the Zampano, uh, the, the, the strong man uh, played by Anthony Quinn is a complete monster. And, and he's a, he abuses um, uh, Giulietta Messina character, Gassoma terribly. But, uh, but somehow Fellini always has a chance for, gives his characters a chance for redemption. He gives them a chance to, he shows um, positive sides to their character. They can change for the better. And, uh, and that's the case in, in La Strada. Uh, and, and um, um, you know, I don't want to give it away, but I mean, the, 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 it's, it's while, while Fellini doesn't never really has happy endings per se, uh, it's um, basically, you know, it's more, it's more like um, Knights of Kiberia where uh, bad things happen, but somehow the people still have a, a spiritual power, resilience to overcome the, uh, the difficulties and end up uh, with a smile on their faces for whatever reason. So, uh, but I mean, if I think of all the Fellini movies, the only one I can think of where there was, where he apparently he did not like um, uh, the... Um, the Donald Sutherland character. What, what uh, what's his name? The um the, the great seducer. What on earth was his name? You know the one I mean. I can't, can't think of it either. Oh well, no, but uh, so so Fellini, because I mean I have this book by for my course. I got this book on Fellini, um, I Fellini, which is I, I recommend strongly for anyone who wants to do this is a series of interviews with Fellini, um with Char uh, done by Charlotte Chandler. And basically, Fellini talks about all of his films in this, and it's, um, I think it's fascinating, fascinating stuff because um, he admits he lies all the time. He, he admits, you know, he doesn't tell the truth. But on the other hand, he likes to embellish stories. And um, he was one of the few uh, apolitical directors. Uh, most Italian film directors were more politically oriented. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, there, there, there was a case of where uh, I, I remember one of these stories I read about him. He was at a Moscow film festival with eight and a half. And this is this is when, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Russia was the Soviet Union. And so the, um, the Marxist Italian critics said, well, you know, eight and a half is, uh, you know, how, how is this uh, realistic. This this film is a complete fantasy. It's self indulgent. It's bourgeois nonsense. And and, um, and Fellini answers, well, um, it's uh, it's a film about reality. This happens to be my reality. My reality might not be the same as your reality, but it's my reality. So it's realistic. So um, I mean that that was his answer. But I mean, yeah, I mean, basically he avoided. Uh, he avoided party politics. He avoided the, I mean, he, he did have a, a definite um, empathy for anyone who was poor. He had an empathy for anyone who, uh, he didn't, uh, even when he's showing the bourgeoisie, uh, he doesn't um, like in um, uh, a number of his films in like uh, what, eight and a half or, or uh, um, he, he doesn't really do it in a, um, at least I, I don't think it's in a nasty way uh, or you're showing the elite in La Dolce Vita does that too. <clears throat> um, but I mean, he, he um, no, he, he avoids ideology and that's, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's very different from a lot of the Italian directors because let's say if you take Bertolucci, who you know, we uh, can talk about, uh, Bertolucci was, um, uh, to, well, for much of his career, he was definitely a Marxist. He was trying to put Marxist ideology in his films. Uh, the Conformist is a good example because um, The Conformist is um, a, a movie based on a, a famous Italian book about uh, by uh, the, the author Alberto Moravia uh, about a um, how basically how a guy becomes a fascist. And, um, and the, um, but the alternative title to that movie is The Fascist. 
and um, and basically the idea simply is is uh, that uh, or the, the thesis is that uh, the guy was um, um, did not have a conventional background, did not have conventional sexual taste, did not was not a conventional person in many ways, but he did his best to conform. So in his desire to conform, he became a fascist. And so the movie traces his personal development. And, um, uh, and Bertolucci does it with, um, I would have to say, um, uh, a sense of humor. I, th I think uh, it's, it's very effective. Uh, but I mean, a, a typical part of that movie is, for example, um, uh, he, the, the character Marcello Clerici, uh, the lead character, um, uh, decides that um, he needs to have a respectable wife, so he, he, he marries this uh, very uh, attractive but very conventional um, uh, actress, uh, Stefania Sandrelli, and, uh, and then uh, when he becomes um, a, a full member of the, the fascist party, they send him on a mission. And the mission is to go to Paris to kill his old professor, who is a uh, considered to be a, a dissident, a dissident professor. So he and his wife go to Paris, and, and this is um, this is one of the classic sequences in, in, in film history. Um, he he goes to Paris. He meets with the professor's family, and then he discovers the professor has a wife, played by the uh, incredible, astonishingly beautiful uh, Italian actress Dominique Sanda. Uh, and he falls in love with her. So here he uh, is meeting with his old professor whom he's supposed to kill, and he's falling in love with the professor's wife. And to make it more interesting, the wife has an affair with his wife. So there are lots of complexities there. And, uh, and this is the kind of thing that Bertolucci loves because he loves to have sexual ambiguity and confusion and complexity. So, but simultaneously, this is still a political film. So ultimately, um, uh, this guy Clarici, the hero or anti-hero, uh, ends up killing the professor in one of, again one of the strongest scenes. I think it was very influenced by the um, the death of Caesar and in, in, in Julius Caesar. But it's just it, it and this is something I, I mentioned before. Uh, the photography uh, by Vittorio Storaro, uh, who shot um, the Conformist is uh, for me, it's a wonder of the world. It's the most incredible cin film cinematographer I've ever seen. And I, I think to this day that Vittorio Storaro is the greatest film cinematographer that there has ever been. He, he also shot um, Apocalypse Now and uh, a few other movies that um, are uh, very memorable, including Bertolucci's The Last Emperor, which I think is another great film. We'll talk a little bit about Lita Rutmuller. Um, of course, we saw Seven Beauties. Uh, she was born in 1928 from a Catholic family. The Wurtmuller name is because uh, her father is descended from a Swiss Catholic family, but uh, her, her family has been Italian for many generations. Um, as her father was a wealthy uh, attorney, but uh, Lena was a problem child. She was expelled from 15 different high schools, which I think is a rather remarkable thing to happen. That's well done, well yeah, done. Yes, I mean, you know, and I don't know whether she was expelled because her skirt was above the knee or she was running an extortion ring, but she was kicked out of 15 schools. She loved comic books, especially Flash Gordon comic books, and uh, got her interest in cinema in a sense through comic books. Um, after her 15 schools, or maybe after her 14th school, a friend of hers suggested that she go to theater school. And so she went to a theater school and fell in love with uh, the idea of, of doing theater. After she left theater school, she started her own theater company. Eventually, she started a puppetry company and traveled around Europe doing puppet shows. But they were not children's puppet shows. They were puppet versions of Franz Kafka's stories, and things like that. They were serious adult puppet works. Um, and then a rather remarkable thing happened. Her, her best friend, Flora Carabella, did something that most women around the world would have loved to do. She married Marcello Mastriani. Well, <laughs> well, having having Marcello Mastriani being the husband of your best friend was a good introduction. Uh, at the time, um, Mastriani was making eight and a half with Fellini, and so she urged her friend to introduce, introduce me, introduce me. And when she met Fellini, she then begged him to become a film assistant. 
and she became an assistant director uh, wow, I didn't lady know. at that time. And that's how she learned the film business and became a director. She then started making a series of films in the 70s. Um, not only was Seven Beauties a big hit, but she made, I got a couple of others. There was um, Swept Away, Love and Anarchy, The Seduction of Mimi, all with Giancarlo Giannini, all very successful. But it was, uh, it was the, the final one, the, the Seven Beauties, that really made a huge hit in America. After that film, Warner Brothers offered her a four film contract to make Hollywood movies. She made the first movie, which was called A Night Full of Rain. It evidently was a critical disaster and a financial bomb. Warner Brothers paid her off not to make any more movies and buy out the contract. She went back to Italy, but what happens, I guess, with some careers, she made a number of movies after that, none of which were very successful, either critically or financially. Um, and so that was the so her career kind of faded away after that. Um, yeah, and do, do you, uh, I mean, that's an incredible story. Do, do you um, have any, I mean, was, did she fall out of favor with the critics or, do, or why do you think she was not successful when she came back to Italy? Well, I don't know the effect. I, I assume, you know, at the height of her career, then making the biggest bomb of her career and then being paid to go away uh, must have been uh, psychological. I don't think she had uh, Giancarlo Giannini when she went back. He was now yeah. working with other people. And um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, what it happens with other artists too. After like one huge hit, suddenly, and if she wasn't a one hit wonder, she had a whole body of very good work in the 70s. And, yeah. then, and then in the 80s, everything fell apart. I, I have no, I couldn't explain why someone's films would suddenly go from being excellent to poor, but. That's incredible, yeah. No, I mean, with Bertolucci, basically, I, I, I you know, he, I mean, he had a long career and, and he uh, started out with, um, uh, in one version, they said his first film was uh, The Spider Strategy. He started out as a very young director um, and he did a film called The Spider Strategy, which was based on a story by Jorge Luis Borges, um, which I thought started, was, it, it was quite successful. But- um, He started making films in English. Bertolucci, right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't know the details of that. Um, the, conform the Conformist was not English. Mm -hmm. And that was like his, I mean, I mean, I know we did some stuff before The Conformist. And I don't know the exact details of that. No, I was thinking of movies like Stealing Beauty and Besieged. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about um, Bertolucci. Yeah. I mean, is it Stealing Beauty was one of his films and so was Besieged. I think they were English or an American, I don't know. No, I mean, he because he, he was like a sort of this boy wonder. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he did, uh, he did, and I, I think we're thinking of talking about different people because he did something called uh, Before the Revolution, Prima della Revolzione, when he was like 18. And, and um, now, I mean, that was definitely Italian. And that was like a very sort of uh, uh, Marxist. Uh, yeah, that was 60, yeah, that was 60. Yeah, that was 64. But, you know, I mean, Stealing Beauty was 96 and Besiege was 98. Well, that's later. I'm talking many, about many later. years later. Yeah. Much later. I'm sorry. Yes, of course, of course, of course. No, no, we're talking about different eras. Okay. So, yeah, so Bertolucci, I mean, you know, but my own feeling about Bertolucci in retrospect, I mean, is that, um, you know, his work has been uneven. Uh, and I think that when he, when he had a good book with a good story, like, uh, like The Conformist or like, um, or like The Last Emperor, uh, basically, technically speaking, uh, he could produce very interesting films. When I felt he, when he has a, had a weak story or he was winging it, as, as is the case with Last Tango in Paris uh, and a few others like that, um, uh, the, you know, the, basically the films don't hold up. Uh, they're, 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 they're sort of interesting, but you know, when you, when you start to look at them, they fall apart. So, uh, so I, I would say, you know, I, basically for Bertolucci, I mean, I recommend, um, the Conformist and also The Last Emperor, both of which won Academy Awards. Or rather, I mean, the, the, the Conformist didn't win an Academy Award, but The Last Emperor definitely won an Academy Award. And I think that's a great film. Um, but uh, no, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different directors in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Italy who did really interesting stuff, but- I mentioned uh, the Gianni yeah. Brothers. Uh, yeah, for example, yes, stars. Yes, yes. Yeah, Ooh. absolutely. Uh, and, um, are there, are there any others that you can think of off the top of your head? 
Um, Tori Scola is another one I like a lot. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, he, he did a film called um, The Investigation of a Citizen Above Suspicion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was a very cool movie. They're, they're all sort of like, I, I, again, I, I'm sure I saw that the Paris cinema, uh, you know, in, in the Plaza Hotel. Uh, but but that was just a very cool movie about a um, a police in the police. Uh, well, I don't know what he's an inspector or commander. He's a fairly high-ranking police officer, played by Gian Maria Volonté, who decides that um, he's going to commit a very clumsy murder uh, to prove that uh, he will not be um, investigated or prosecuted because he's a, he's, he's a high-ranking policeman. And so uh, so he arranges to uh, kill his mistress, uh, who's played by the, the beautiful Florinda Volcan, and, uh, and does a real mess of the investigation. And, and, and uh, well, there's a messy job, leaves clues everywhere, and then is horrified when he sees, or he actually amused, not horrified, but he's amused when he sees his colleagues uh, making such a mess of the investigation because the last thing they want to do is accuse the high-ranking police chief. So that to me is a very subversive film in a very intelligent way. The, the other one who we, we've kind of skirted around is one of the most famous ones, um, uh, Lucina Visconti, yes. who started out as one of the neorealists in, in, in during the Second World War. I think he made one of the first uh, neorealist films. Terra Rocco Tremor. and his brothers, I think. Rocco yeah, and one his of brothers. One of the, that, that and Terra Tremor are like a two, two of the first um, uh, neorealistic films. And then he made a whole bunch of films, which I thought were, uh, you know, he, he made some really excellent movies. Uh, the, probably the most famous one for most Americans is Death in Venice, uh, which is uh, the composer Gustav Mahler uh, was in love with his boy. And uh, on, this is in Venice in like in 19, around the turn of the century. And, um, and then uh, he uh, is dying of tuberculosis, so he can never really, um, do anything and the whole movie is like one long dirge to Mahler's music and the beauty of Venice and uh, it's a very um, it's a very beautiful film uh, it's uh, there's not you know there's not a lot of drama but I mean, it's a very it's, it's, it's a really beautiful film and then but my favorite Visconti film is uh, The Damned which is about the Krupp family in Germany where he really he had a strong story and for those, those who don't know it the Krupp family um, was the leading arm or one of the leading armaments producers in in, um, in Nazi Germany, and uh, this is a very um, uh, in Visconti's film that the family is a very they're, they're extremely corrupt, and uh, they have all sorts of sexual issues, and they have um, uh, as well as doing the the things they're doing politically, and as well and of course profiting on uh, death, which is uh, the arms industry. And that I think is a great, great film. That's with uh, Helmut Berger, the the, the actor, and um, and one of my favorite actresses, the Swedish actress uh, Ingrid Tulin. Uh, that that I thought was a great movie. Should we wrap up our uh, rambling? Yeah, so uh, so we could go on and on and on and on about <laughs> uh, Italian films. We will not uh, we will not uh, abuse your um, kind um, attention. So thank you so much. We uh, hope we hope you've enjoyed the series. And uh, we look forward to you talking to you about our next series, uh, and which will hopefully be in the not so distant future. Thank you. Ciao. Molto grazie. And thank you.